Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways. As a nation that did righteousness and did not forsake the ordinance of their God, they ask of me the ordinances of justice. They take delight in approaching God. Why have we fasted, they say, and have you not seen? Why have we afflicted our souls and you take no notice? In fact, in the day of your fast, you find pleasure and exploit all your labourers. Indeed, you fast for strife and debate and to strike with the fist of wickedness. You will not fast, you will not fast as you do this day to make your voice heard on high. Is it a fast that I have chosen? A day for a man to afflict his soul. Is it to bow down his head like a, like a bulrush and to spread a sackcloth and ashes? Would you call this a fast and an acceptable day to the Lord? Is this not the fast that I have chosen to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens? To let the oppressed go free and that you break every yoke. Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and that you bring to your house the poor who are cast out? When you see the naked, that you cover him and not hide yourself from him from your own flesh. Then your light shall break forth like the morning. Your healing shall well, your sorry, your healing shall spring forth speedily, and your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the God of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry, and He will say, "Here I am." If you take away the yoke from your midst the pointing of the finger and speaking wickedness, if you extend your soul to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted soul, then your light shall dawn in the darkness and and your darkness shall be as the noonday. The The Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your soul in this, in, and satisfy your soul in drought and strengthen your bones. You shall be like a watered garden and like a spring of water whose water, waters do not fail. Those from among you shall build the old waste places. You shall raise up the foundations of many generations and you shall be called the repeater, the repairer of the breach, the restorer of, stri- of streets to dwell in. If you turn away your foot from the Sabbath, from, your, from doing your pleasure on my holy day and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy day of the Lord honourable, and shall honour him not doing your own ways, nor finding your own pleasure, nor speaking your own words. Then you shall delight yourself in the Lord, and I will cause you to ride on the high hills of the earth and feed you with the heritage of Jacob your father. The mouth of the Lord has spoken. These are the words of the Lord. Pastor Shane, please. Right. This morning we want to welcome Pastor Shane from ACC and he's with Hands at Work in Africa. We want to welcome Rachel, she's the director of the Australian Harm of Hands at Work, um, Philip, her husband, and Riley, who has joined them from. Uh, uh, what time did you arrive here from? Uh, um, where, where do you live? Sunbury. I don't know where Sunbury is, but sounds like a. 
<laughs> just before seven. And you know, it's very difficult to get a young man to come up before, <laughs> come before seven. He has done very well, isn't it? Great one, great one. So welcome, Pastor Shane. Uh, we welcome Pastor Shane to share the word of God with us this morning. Thank you, Pastor Richard, and, and again, thank you for the opportunity to come and share the word. Um, it's a, obviously a privilege and an honour to be able to come and share the word. So my name's uh, Shane, as you've heard. Um, I'm a qualified school teacher, um, but have been in the ministry now for over 30 years. Uh, we planted a church in Whittlesea with four couples uh, back way back, <laughs> um, and I think we're out to the 33rd anniversary. Um, I left as senior pastor two years ago to allow a younger couple to come in and, and take over the church. But greetings from Whittlesea, greetings from my wife, uh, Millie, or Melania. Um, she would have loved to have come, but uh, I, I got the better deal today. I, I get to come to this beautiful place called Dingley. Um, she's looking after six of my grandchildren, uh, while my daughter and uh, her husband have gone to a wedding. Um, so I think she's doing it tough this morning. But uh, my, also my association with Hands of Work, it's actually the same daughter, asked to go on a missions trip uh, way back in 2001. Um, and so we sent her over to South Africa to a pastor that I taught with um, at Northside Christian College. And she met George and Carolyn over there in 2001. I went back in 2002 to spend some time with them at the Africa School of Missions. And then came back and said, Dad, you need to go to Africa. You need to meet George. You need to see what they're doing. And so we took our first team. I think it was the first Australian team to, to head over in 2003 to Hands at Work. And uh, I still remember George saying to me when I first got there, we had nothing about Africa, we knew nothing about where we were going, but we just went. And uh, George said to me, um, you may think that Africa needs you, but you need Africa. And it was something that uh, I didn't quite understand at the time. I thought, well, that's a bit arrogant. Um, but as I spent time over there, I realised that God was using that experience to change our heart, to understand what the heart of God really is. Because we can be in a little bubble, aren't we? And interestingly enough, I think today, it's the Western church that is in crisis. Uh, in many other countries of the world, the church is flourishing. The church is growing. And that's because they don't have the same things that will hold us uh, to our world and to our culture as we do here in Australia. But maybe COVID-19 is changing that a little bit around. We'll see. So this morning I'm going to share from Isaiah chapter 58. Have you ever wondered why Jesus clashed so much with the religious leaders of the times? You know, he seemed to, the only people he seemed to have a challenge with were the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the teachers of the law. It wasn't even with the Romans who were uh, the, 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 the people who were uh, enslaving, you might say, Jerusalem, but it was the religious leaders that Jesus had trouble with. And um, perhaps it was because they played religion. Now, you've got to be careful when I speak of the word religion, but I don't really think God wants us to be religious. He would prefer us to be relationship-wise. Because that's what he wants with us. He wants a relationship with us. The whole reason he sent his son, Jesus Christ, was to have a relationship, to open up the doors again for us to have a relationship with the Father through the Son, Jesus Christ. And so in Isaiah, we find this dialogue where Isaiah is purporting the words of God to a people who is his nation. It's the Israelites. And it's interesting, it's uh, probably about fasting, but it actually goes deeper than that. It's about the attitude of the heart. It's the state of the heart of the Israelites. Because fasting, we usually do as a, as a, a time when we give up something 
to actually pray to God, to seek God. It might be for a breakthrough, it might be for a healing, it may be just to get guidance from the Lord. And I have no problem with fasting, I've done it myself. But it's the motivation behind the fasting that uh, God is actually addressing right here. So if we start in verse 3, and thank you to the reader who's already read the, the scripture for us. In verse 3, it says, We have fasted before you, they say. Why aren't you impressed? We have done much penance and you don't even notice it. Isn't it interesting? They come to God and they say, Hey, hey God. Aren't you impressed with our fasting? Aren't you impressed with our religious piety that we are portraying? We've done all this penance, but it doesn't appear that you've noticed. And God responds and he says, I will tell you why. Good question. Be ready for the answer. It's because you are living for yourselves even while you are fasting. You are living for yourselves. Is it possible for us Christians that we, we are still selfish? <laughs> we are still self-centered? We are still living for ourselves? I think one of my, the heartaches that I have is I, I just believe the church should be a place where people run to. And yet, quite often, they're the ones that we avoid the church. In other words, when Jesus walked this earth, people ran to him. They followed him. They were always going, uh, wanting to get something uh, from Jesus, whether it was a healing, but many of them sat down while he shared the word. They came to him because there was something about Jesus that cared for people, that showed that he cared and loved. As we read on, it says, you're living for yourselves, even while you're fasting. You keep right on oppressing your workers. What good is fasting when you keep on fighting and quarreling? This kind of fasting will never get you anywhere with me. He's saying you can be as pious as you like. You can put on all the exterior um, signs that you are spiritual and you are doing the right thing, but if your heart's not right, if you're not doing it with the right motivation, you're not going to get anywhere with me. He says, you humble yourselves by going through the motions of penance, bowing your heads like a blade of grass in the wind. You dress in sackcloth and cover yourselves with ashes. Is this what you call fasting? Do you really think this will please the Lord? I don't think God is ever really impressed by outward spirituality or even outward expressions of praise and worship when they don't flow from a heart of love and reverence and honour. Our faith in God is never meant to be insular, where we just take, in fact, Jesus said you will become rivers of living water, not dams. You all know that the Dead Sea is dead because the water runs in but doesn't go anywhere. And so the water stagnates in the Dead Sea. They say you can't drown. I've never tried it, never been there. But they say you can't drown in the Dead Sea. It is so salty, but nothing lives in it. You see, a dam that takes in nutrients but does nothing with it will die. A heart that takes in God's love but does nothing with it will eventually shrivel. We are called to be rivers of living water that whatever God gives us flows out again for the good of other people. And so in verse 6 we read, No, the kind of fasting I want calls you to free those who are wrongly imprisoned and stop oppressing those who work for you. Treat them fairly. Give them what they earn. I want you to share your food with the hungry and to welcome poor wanderers in your homes Give clothes to those who need them and do not hide from relatives who need your help. If you've got any relatives that you're hiding from because they need help, it's a hard one, isn't it? But what God is really getting to here is you fast, you might give up food, you might give up some uh, drink. Today, I guess some people give up 
watching TV or give up multimedia. They, they take a fast, they stop that, and hopefully they're spending that time with the Lord. They're spending that time getting closer to the Lord. But God says he wants you to give up yourself. Jesus said you have to lose your life to find your life. And if you lose self and become outward in what you are doing, you will actually start to touch other people's lives. You know, in these verses, God outlines his desires for you and I. It's to treat all people respectfully and fairly. It's to share our food with the hungry and welcome wanderers into our home. To give clothes to those who need them, and not to avoid relatives that need your help. You see, as Christians, we are not meant to wear a label or a badge that says we are Christians. We actually live it out. We demonstrate our faith and service to Christ in the way we speak to others, in the way we think about others, and in the way we act towards people and love them. It's a big ask. But God promises good results. His promise is that if you do these things, there's going to be a consequence in your life. There will be a fruit that comes into your life. There will be a blessing that comes. In verse 8, he says, if you do these things, your salvation will come like the dawn. Yes, your healing will come quickly. Your godliness will lead you forward. And the glory of the Lord will protect you from behind. Then when you call, the Lord will answer, yes, I am here, and he will quickly reply. I love that verse that says, your salvation will come like the dawn. You know, in Whittlesea, we live uh, close to the King Lake Ranges, and sometimes in the morning, go out to walk the dog, and, and it's dark, and then you will just see the sun begin to rise over the mountains, and the light begins to spread, and the warmth and the, and the, and the sunshine begins to take over the land. You know, we live in a world that is, is quite dark in some ways, isn't it? And it's getting darker. But let me say this. Darkness is not an entity on its own. Darkness is the absence of light. That's it. Darkness is the absence of light. When light, when you open the door and there's a lighted room and a dark room, what happens? The light flows into the dark room. Darkness doesn't flow the other way. So I love that song that we sang about the light. Jesus is the light of the world. Everywhere that Jesus went, darkness was pushed back. Spiritual darkness pushed back, pushed back. And you know, as a church today, we have that same calling upon our lives to be the light of the world. And boy, our world needs it. Boy, this state needs it. Our nation needs it. We need the light to be shining. He says, your godliness will lead you forward. God will lead us. When we are willing to open up our hearts to him and and get in touch with that heart, it says he will lead you. He will guide you. I have no doubt in my mind that God took us to Africa. He led us to Africa. Because that's where I needed to go. It says, stop oppressing the helpless. Stop making false accusations. Stop spreading vicious rumors. Stop gossiping. He said, rather feed the hungry and help those who are in trouble. I hope you can grasp how important relationships are to God. And we've got to stop focusing on other people's sins and weaknesses and their problems. And we need to focus on their needs. Every time we knock someone, we're actually part of the problem. Every time we help someone, we're part of the solution. God doesn't want us to be part of the problem. He actually wants us to be part of the solution. God says, I will give you everything you need. Jesus said in in, uh, John chapter 15, all you have to do is remain in him and let his word remain in you and you will bear fruit fruit. Then 
Your light will shine out from the darkness and the darkness surrounds you will be as bright as day. Is that a beautiful verse? When we follow this, it's going to make a difference in your family. When you allow the love of Christ to flow out of you in the way you speak to each other in your family, the way you look after each other and you care for you, the light is going to shine brightly in your family. And God's promise is healing will come. Restoration will come. And then it goes a little bit wider and it goes into your community. I believe that God loves the family. He created the family. And every time we get our families together uh, and shine that light, a healthy family will contribute to a healthy community and a healthy community and it just rolls on, doesn't it? The rippling effect is so wonderful. The Lord will guide you continually, water in your life when you are dry. Listen to that. The Lord will guide you continually, water in your life when you are dry and keeping you healthy. When we are outward thinking, when we are looking out for those who we can help, God says you will get energy beyond. Remember when Jesus was sitting at the well and they came back, he was tired and he was sitting at the well. And when the disciples came back with food and he had been talking to the woman at the well, they said, somebody giving you something to eat because he seemed energized. And he said, no, my food is the will of the Father. He was energized by the fact that he was ministering to someone, caring for someone, drawing out the hurts and pains in someone and seeing them set free. You will be like a well-watered garden, like an ever-flowing spring. Your children, I love this part, says your children will rebuild the deserted ruins of your cities and then you'll be known as the people who rebuild their walls and cities. I throw it out to you, we need to rebuild our communities. We need to rebuild families. We need to rebuild our communities. We need to rebuild our state and our country because it's in a sad place at the moment. But what God is saying here is that when we put our hope and our trust in him, we will see. I pray that my kids do far greater things than I've ever done in this world. They're going to do some amazing things. You see, what God is really saying here is he doesn't want false worship. He says religion that is impersonal turned inward, self-gratifying, is not the worship he wants. The worship he wants is for us to lay down our lives for him. In James 1, 26 to 27, it says, if anyone considers himself religious and yet does not keep a tight rein on his tongue, then he deceives himself and his religion is worthless. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Ray Stedman said the ultimate test of faith has always been, does it lead you to serve, to help someone? Just throw out a challenge for you. Sometimes, and I've been guilty, we get up and we say, oh, I hope the worship's good today. I hope the message is good. I hope I get something out of church today. Well, let's flip that around a bit. What if you got up on a Sunday morning and said, Lord, who can I bless today? Lord, who can I encourage today? Lord, we hear some beautiful words uttered before. Lord, Can you give me a word for someone today? It changed the whole atmosphere of your church, all our churches. If we came with that attitude, Lord, I'm here to bless someone today. I'm here to encourage someone today, to support someone today. You see, it's a change of attitude, isn't it? It's a change of heart that the God is looking for. Catherine Booth said, 
You are not here in the world for yourself. You have been sent here for others. The world is waiting for you. And I believe that even though the church doesn't, I mean, the, the, the community doesn't say it at the moment, the, the community is actually waiting for the church to rise up in power and light and love. Because that's what's missing in our world today. No matter what's going on in the world today, the, we have the answer in Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Saviour. He still heals today. You believe that? He still binds up broken hearts today. He still sets people free today. That's our God. And he uses you and I to actually do that. Locally, overseas, wherever he leads us, he gives us the opportunity to touch someone's life. You know, John 13, 34 to 35, Jesus said to his disciples, a new command I give you. Love one another. Well, it's probably not a new command. We've heard that before. But then he goes on to clarify. He says, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. So in other words, it's no longer about loving others like you love yourself. I want you to go out there and love them as I have loved you. That's the benchmark. Wow. Wow that the Holy Spirit comes. If we reflect back on Isaiah 58, we can see that there is something special flows from a heart that's given out to the Lord. It is an enlightened life. It says, your light shall shine out of the darkness. In your homes, in your neighbourhoods, in your communities, in your workplace, in your schools, if you allow God's heart to be your heart, your light will begin to shine. Your light will begin to shine. Your light will begin to shine. It's a guided life. He says he will guide you continually. It's a satisfied life. He will water your life when you are dry and keep you healthy. It's a fragrant life, like a well-watered garden. I think of roses and the beautiful flowers and the fragrance. It's a freshly sustained life, like a spring of water whose waters are ever flowing. And it's a productive life, a healing life. You shall rebuild the deserted ruins of your city. I just want to leave you with that thought this morning. This area needs this church. They may not know it yet, but it's the truth. You carry around Jesus Christ. You carry around his love. You carry around his purpose. You carry around healing. You carry around restoration. People need the church to rise up. Not to be a church that's, dare I use the word hypocritical, where we say things, but our actions don't follow what we say. They're not looking for more condemnation. They're not looking for us to criticise them. They're actually looking for us to love them. They're looking for someone to bind up their broken heart. There's a lot of that around. They're looking for someone who will show them how to get out of the darkness they are in. And come back here to the light where they can find healing and restoration. I'll finish with one little last story. A few years ago, there's a lady in our church who was a carer. And she came to me and she said to me, Pastor, can you go and visit this guy in the hospital? He, he's got cancer and they don't expect him to live anymore. And so I, I went to visit him at the Olivia Newton-John Cancer Centre. Um, his name was Mark. <laughs> and I walked in the room and he says, I know who you are. Don't say nothing about God. Not interested. Don't mention Jesus. Don't even know why you're here. And I said, that's all right, Mark. And the Holy Spirit just said, talk to him about 
whatever he wants to talk about. So for the next half hour, I just found out that he loved fishing, he loved hunting, and we, that's all we spoke about. And then at the end, I said to him, can I pray for you before I leave? Oh, he said, well, you can if you want to, but yeah, I'm not really interested. But that's fine, I pray. Very simple prayer. Lord, reveal yourself to Mark. I said, can I come back and talk to you again? He said, yeah, if you want to. So, so I went back and we talked about fishing and hunting, talked about death and life. And that went on a couple of weeks. And then I got there one week and he wasn't in his room. He was actually out having a cigarette on the balcony. And I went out there and he said to me, I've been waiting for you. I want to know about Jesus. He gave his heart to the Lord and passed away two weeks later. What a testimony it was to his family. But that wasn't about me. That's about God saying, if you will make yourself available, if you will just love people where they are at, I can do the rest. I can do the rest. And that's what Hands at Work does. Hands at Work is a place, it's, it's a, a family that is, when I started with Hands at Work, it was one village in South Africa called Masoi. And you know what? I used to go out there and, and all we'd have was some tablets and ointment and death was in the air. And now I went back there several years later and the people are just working, they're healthy, they're all in school. It just needs some people to stand up and say, I'm willing to make a difference. I'm willing to share what God has given me with others. And God's light will shine and shine brightly. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are a God that loves us with a passion. You so loved us that even while we were still sinners, you sent your son, Jesus Christ. And he himself said, I did not come to be served, but I came to serve. Lord, may our hearts be so filled with love that we would be rivers of living water, rivers of living water that's splashing out around the people around us, that we would be a light for those who are living in darkness, that we would be able to, Lord, Father, touch people's lives through practical ways of reaching out and supporting them and loving them. Father, I thank you for this beautiful church. Thank you for Pastor Richard, and I pray your blessing over them, Lord, in Jesus' name. I pray your blessing over them. I pray fruitfulness over them. I pray that, Lord, Father, that this church will be a shining light in this community, and the Lord, that you will send the lost, the lonely, the hurting people to come to this church where they will find people who will love them, accept them, value them, and give them a place to belong and give them a place where they can connect with you. And I ask that in Jesus' name. Amen.